Hey there, Dave Politis, Canon Missing Project, copyrighted edition for a video channel. And back in the silo today, it's a brisk 15 degrees outside, pretty chilly. And uh, it's a nice 40 degrees here in the silo, so uh, welcome. Uh, gratitude. I'm going to start this off the right way today. Many of you have been very kind to me. Just watching this, you're very kind to spend your time and talk our way through certain things in this world. Select few of you have gone way out of your way and been unbelievably nice to me. And I'm going to show you a couple things that some people have sent me. I'm going to start off with, a lot of people know that uh, Bigfoot was a big part of my uh, early life. And uh, this person did this engraving that was just absolutely awesome. And uh, I greatly appreciate it. Dave, thanks for all you do. Trish Martin, thank you. Appreciate it, Trish. It's been up in my office all the way. And then uh, this one for, for uh, my son. It's also in my office. I appreciate it. I like the outdoors. I like wood. And then and someone had a 90-year-old lady do this quilt for me. And I'm telling you, it's downstairs in my TV room right now. And uh, it's absolutely awesome. Look at this. It's a quilt. It's gorgeous. Yeah, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. And there's been, there's been much, much more. A farm sent me a, a box full of a bunch of goodies, nuts and things, and people sent me little lamps. And there's been too many letters to count and cards. And uh, I'm very humbled by the gratitude. And uh, I think we as people, no matter how little you think you have, you gotta be appreciative that you have it. Sometimes I think we lose sight of where we're at in life. I wake up every morning and I have huge gratitude for where I am. Thinking where I could have been in California locked down, wearing a mask, forced to get four different vaccines. Here, there's none of that in Montana. So I'm very grateful. I'm appreciative. And the people that I see in this community every day all have the same sort of mindset. Very appreciative. So, start with that. Next thing I want to talk about is uh, a couple weeks ago, somebody sent me a note who's a special agent and he said, Dave, you have a big audience and you do a lot of great things. Why don't you inform them about fentanyl? And he was right. And I've talked to you about it a little bit. But if you're a grandmother, grandfather, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, if some way or another there's a person in your life that dabbles in drugs and narcotics, pay attention to the next five minutes. It's huge, it's hugely important. Fentanyl is primarily imported from China. Yes, China. They are trying to kill us. I don't care what you say, they are trying to kill us. And I'm gonna show you something right off the bat that I showed to you before, but it's the best diagram to remind everybody where we're at with this. The primary importer of all fentanyl is China. This is from a DEA declassified report. It shows all the locations in China and how they're getting it to North America. And they're getting it through Mexico, Central America, and Canada, and some direct importing into the US via shipping containers. And this is the way that they're processing it up through the U.S. Now, friends, 
What China is doing and what they've done is they made alliances with gangs in Mexico, cartels. And they showed them a way to make money with fentanyl. And they gave them the precursors to make it. Yeah. And they're importing it into the United States for one reason. To kill us. To kill you. To kill your brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, nephews. That's right. And this is the sad part. It's worked its way into cocaine, methamphetamine, and some types of marijuana. That's, this is the scary part. Normally people in the drug world know when you got cocaine, it was gonna be cocaine, not anymore. And I'm gonna read you a report, short, I'm just a short one, from the Asia, Asia Media International, a publication from Loyola Marymount University's Asia Pacific Media Center in Los Angeles. So this is a university reporting on this. Here's how it works. This is what they said. After the chemicals and ingredients used to produce fentanyl are imported from China, the drugs are manufactured in Mexico, then smuggled over the southern border. Now I'm going to stop there for a second. Do you know how many people got across our southern border in November that were not caught? Getaways, they were called. Sit down. 50,000. This was just reported. 50,000 getaways. Means we know nothing about those people. But the way the drug cartels do it is they take all the people that are paying them money to get them across and they ship them over in mass in one area, like a hundred at a time. And they overwhelm border patrol and they have to call in resources from adjoining jurisdictions or regions to handle this mass input. They know this opens up this region over here and that's where they send all their drugs through and the getaways that they need. Terrorists, criminals, murderers, rapists. Yeah, they've caught them all at the border. And if you don't believe me, you know, you're watching the wrong channel on TV. Because certain channels report on this every day. Back to the fentanyl. In addition, cartels can stamp fentanyl into pills. So they resemble prescription pills like Adderall and Xanax. According to the DEA, two out of five of these fake pills contain potentially lethal, lethal doses of fentanyl. Now, if they're making the pills to look like something else, and they put a lethal amount of fentanyl in them, there's only one way, folks, this works. They're trying to kill us. Yes. Back to the, the writing. The Customs and Border Patrol drug seizure stats exhibit a substantial increase and the total weight of fentanyl seized. So far, the 2021 total weight is 10,500 pounds, which accounts for a 51% of the total drugs seized. The prior year's totals remained at 2,283 pounds, or 4,791 4, pounds of fentanyl seized in total. So it's almost a 60% increase. The China strategy. So they're going to take out our young people because we know we have a habit of younger people, especially in college and, and people that are willing to try something different in some colleges, not all. They're going to seep this into our society in pills that are supposedly to help us study. And that's going to kill us. And they're going to put it in coke and crank. And that's going to kill us. And our government, I don't care what you say, is allowing this to happen because of the open border policy. If families can come through and spend their time in the U.S. and immediately get let through, that's why it's not slowing down. I don't care what anybody says. The crush at the border is not slowing down. It's coming just as hard as it was six months ago, if not harder. And when they feed people through one side and the other side's wide open, that's where all the drugs are going through. That's where all the bad guys are going through. The people that are controlling the border right now are the cartels. And you can ask any supervising border patrol officer 
and they will tell you that off the record. There's enough of them in our community, you can ask them. And why can't they go on the record? Because our government has told the Border Patrol people not to talk. So the only people that can talk from the Border Patrol is the uh, president of the Border Patrol Association, and he's on certain news broadcasts all the time telling you exactly what's happening. Also, sheriffs from jurisdictions on the border. Also, Texas uh, troopers are telling all the time what they're doing and why they have to have National Guard at the border pr to, protect their <clears throat> to protect their people and their residences there. It's a horror show. So, kill our young people, take away our pride, destroy us from within. Don't come from the outside, destroy us from within. Our greed, our need for drugs, eliminate the critical thinkers. And how do you do that? Well, you get our government to mandate that the army, that our armies, Navy, Air Force, Marines have to take the vaccine. Well, the critical thinkers in those groups say, I'm not doing that. Well, then what's our government going to do? They're going to throw them out of the military. And there go your critical thinkers or the people that would look at the inside of their organization and say, hey, this isn't right. We need to change. No, they're gone. What's going on now? is destruction of our world at multiple levels. We have people that have got elected into office with the help of tens of millions of dollars from billionaires to get them elected. And unless we wake up quickly, our world is going to get destroyed rapidly. Our world meaning the United States of America. Unless we speak up as a nation and say, hey, we are not putting up with this anymore. It's going to happen. Now, I know in Montana, a couple weeks ago, we had rallies in every big city. And there were thousands of people that showed up, all like me, saying, hey, we aren't putting up with it. This is going to end. Did you see any news coverage of that? No. But I know that it happened. It's okay, because you know who saw it? Our politicians. The message got across here. And they're starting, and they have already drafted legislation in, to protect us, just like they did in Florida and Texas. It's happening. All right, a couple letters. Dave, I'm 30 years old and I live in Northeast British Columbia in a town called Chetland. I spent my early childhood on a small farm 45 minutes from town. We relied fully on homegrown and naturally harvested meat and produce. As an adult, I continue to live that way, hunting as a must to fill the freezer every year to feed my growing family. To keep this email short, I will only talk about the most recent oddity. Now what I did is uh, I printed out a map for you, kind of where we're talking about in British Columbia. So this is Dawson Creek, British Columbia. This is the Alberta border. This is uh, Bear Hole Lake Provincial Park and Protected Area, Tumbler Ridge, Chetwind, Gwillem Lake Provincial Park. This area right here, really, really thick, not a lot of people go there, and it can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Here's a story. Late August 2020, early bull moose season, my wife and I were hunting between Chetwind and Tumbler Ridge in a remote area. We drove up a small logging road that I have been hunting for many years successfully. We parked the truck and hiked into a two-year-old cut block, maybe about two kilometers. The trail we followed was the old deactivated access road that went along the top of the heavily wooded drainage. Dense with old growth spruce and thick alder and devil's club. The whole area is densely populated with grizzly bears so the alert is always high. As us in the cut block, we were told frequently listening and glassing for any movement. 
We began our way back towards the truck early evening, maybe 5 to 6 p.m. Due to the lack of any sign, we were going to check elsewhere. And what he's saying is they looked around, they didn't find any game, there was no sign of any game in the area, so they were moving on. Out of nowhere, we heard a loud sound. It was coming down from above us, following the terrain of the steep hillside, heading straight for us. It was like an extremely loud, vibrating humming sound. I instinctively swung my rifle around to face this thing, and my wife ducked. We were about six feet apart. It was almost surreal and disorienting at the same time. Whatever this invisible thing was flew by between us at about head level. It smashed into the trees below us in the dark timber with a horrible crash of breaking branches and something large landing on the ground. Now the weird part. <laughs> that was pretty weird what you said, but yeah. After we heard it hit the ground, whatever this was took off running. Let's just say adrenaline was high and I was trained on that spot already for something to show itself. Thankfully, it took off deeper into the darkness in the opposite direction. My wife was shaking and could barely talk. Meanwhile, I was trying to rationalize the situation. We didn't waste any time booking it back to the truck. Curious if you've heard anything like this or similar. Thank for all your hard work. Uh, no. <laughs> but I probably would have reacted the same way you did. Didn't see anything, didn't hear anything other than that. I definitely would have left. But the question comes in, what would have been flying through between you like that? I can't imagine. Interesting story. But I will say, having spent a lot of time in British Columbia in the last 25 years. Places always intrigue me because there is so much unusualness to that area. There is so many missing people in British Columbia that I wrote about missing 411 Canada. Something's going on. Dave, your story about the sounds of the stampede in Wyoming piqued my interest because I've had this experience before. Except in my case, I was about 12 years old, lying awake at 1 a.m. while the rest of the house was sound asleep. And instead of a stampede, it was the sound of a jet engine that I truly thought was going to blow our house apart. I was curled up in my bed waiting for my parents to come upstairs and rescue me, but nothing happened. The noise stopped after 30 seconds and the house was quiet again. As it would turn out, no one else on my family of six heard it. How could that be? It was so loud the entire neighborhood should have heard it. I've heard stories like this over the years on investigations and I believe I have an answer. It would seem that your stampede did indeed happen, but it happened in the past and it left a psychic imprint in that area. Normally these events play on a loop, meaning they occur every six months at the same time or every 20 years at the same time. Could your clapping have instigated this psychic event? It would be fascinating to know, and I would implore you to go back to that location and clap again. Yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> See what happens, please. I would love to know if there's a reaction. The other part of your story that rattled me was the teepee fire by the water. I'd love to know what your dad was thinking that frightened him so. It's a creepy story for sure. Love your videos. Thank you so much for your time and your effort because I really look forward to the days when I know they'll pop up on YouTube. P.S. I know you don't like long emails, so I hope this one's kept short enough. Know that Ben is at peace and he's with you. Pay attention to the little things. Thank you. So my dad and I, in later years, talked about that event. Little tiny teepee about this hall made of wood right next to the water. My dad kind of thought that there was somebody maybe living in that valley. Uh, off the grid or maybe there was a bad guy in there but he said whoever it was didn't want us to be there and he definitely didn't want us to see him so that's why he said we're leaving and admittedly at my age now if I was with my son and we went into that area I wouldn't feel comfortable sleeping there knowing that somebody had started that fire and then took off so, 
Hi Dave, I watched your broadcast on November 28th and thought it was excellent. After hearing your request that viewers uh, possibly share some experience, here it goes. I'm 70, a lifetime outdoorsman, and have been alone in the wilds during all seasons from the southern states all the way up to the Arctic and in every hour of the day or night. I'm very comfortable out there, which is more than I could say when I'm in town and among crowds of people. <laughs> That's true. There have been a handful of very odd experiences during all these years, and what follows is my recollection of one that I find really puzzling. I'm a fisherman. Near the end of the third week in August 1998, I was fishing on Lake Jokasi, J-O-C-A-S-S-E-E, -S -S -E, which is located in the mountains of upstate South Carolina. Part of this 7,500 acre lake is actually in North Carolina, and is approximately 60 air miles from Cades Cove, Tennessee. Cades Cove, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, spent a lot of time there, know it very well. The shoreline is undeveloped, and you're more likely to see a bear on shore than a human. Very true, lots of bears in that area. The, the entire Jokasi Gorges area is largely uninhabited except for deer, bear, and a few wild pigs, bobcats, and a host of small fur bearers. Back in the 80s, I found a set of pug marks from a cougar about 15 miles southeast of the lake, even though the wildlife department claims there aren't any in the state. I was born and raised in the area and I'm very familiar with the animals thereabouts. I feel confident saying that I can easily identify all by sight, sound, track, or scat. Yeah, the, the statement about Tennessee not wanting to admit there's cougar or mountain lions there, it's a joke. They've been caught on game cameras there in the state several times, but they still don't want to admit it. Back to the story. Due to increased boat traffic during summer months, I only fished at night and my target species was largemouth and smallmouth bass. After dark, I rarely saw another boat. The lake held huge specimens of both species of bass and I was fishing for a giant. Let me add, I release every large bass that I've ever caught. This is an ultra clear lake and the trophy sized bass are very spooky. So my fishing was actually a lot like stalking big game. A huge percentage, about 93% of this lake is in excess of 50 feet deep and is very difficult to fish. Because of this, it was known as the lake that bass fishermen hate. I was also, it was also a very dangerous lake as well due to sudden winds and treacherous, treacherous waves. Unfortunately, more than a few boaters lost their lives under such conditions, even in broad daylight. All but a few were afraid to venture out after dark. Through the years, I'd located a few shallower spots that the bass used for feeding after dark, and I usually approach these slowly and silently. I used the moon extensively in planning my trips, and my favorite phase was around the new moon. Under these low light conditions, the bass were less spooky and therefore more likely to visit these spots. Over time, I developed a topographical map of the lake bottom in my head, so once in the general area of a spot, all lights were out, and I navigated the remaining distance on my Lawrence. The bottom contours were to me the same as a road map. That's true if you know the area. I always tried to cover the last several hundred feet without even using my electric trolling motor, instead of relying on wind or current to carry me in. Even so, one or two casts were all you could count on before that spot was ruined for the night because once disturbed, the bass would simply drop off into deep water. Local terrain steep, and since much of the lake is greater than 250 feet in depth, Water often extends right up to near the vertical shoreline. I usually fished alone, but on this night, my friend and I had just approached a huge underwater tree which had fallen in from the eroding bank. The large root ball of the oak was resting on an underwater ledge. The tree was submerged with the top suspended out over deep water. It was our intention to fish this tree. This was an unusual spot in that even though the banks were a steep drop into the water, there was a small ravine which angled down the hillside, ending in a small sandy area on the water's edge. We drifted in with the wind coming from our right and had been quite, absolutely quiet during our approach. I was in the bow of a 20-foot boat as we made our first few casts. What happened next took us totally by surprise, to say the least. When our half-ounce Texas-rigged plastic worms splashed down about 90 feet away, all hell broke loose on the bank above and behind the sandy area, which lay 30 feet to the right of the submerged tree. 
with no visible moon, it was pitch black, and all we had was our ears and sonar unit with which to orient ourselves. Dave, I've had close encounters with bears and moose, moose, but not once in all those years that I ever gotten overly excited. This was different. I've always had the reputation of being exceptionally calm. Some said I had ice water in my veins, but this was spooky. What unnerved me about it was I had no idea what on earth I was hearing. It was a loud, very loud, and I'll try to describe it the best I can in the hopes that it will resonate with you and one of your viewers. It began as a roaring scream unlike anything I'd heard. Quite frankly, I got the distinct impression that whatever it was had been startled by us. The scream seemed to be what I took as an excited warning, sort of an, I don't know you were there and I'm dangerous if that makes any sense. What immediately followed the scream most closely resembled noises that I had heard apes make when they were angry and excited, only much louder and much deeper. At this point, I looked down at my forward sonar unit to see how much water I had under the boat, just to make certain that whatever it was was making those sounds couldn't get to us. The response was totally illogical because I had already knew full well that we were in deep water about 90 feet off the bank, plus I was armed. My having even looked at the sonars proved positive to me that I wasn't thinking rationally. The bottom was well, of 100, well over 100 feet deep, which was very comforting because I had no desire to deal with whatever this thing was. At the same time, all this ruckus was being on. I told my friend to grab the million power candle Q-beam on the console and eliminate that area where the noise was coming from. All we ever saw was the top of a large hardwood sapling about 50 feet from shore that was shaking violently. The intervening woods were very dense and the undergrowth near the ground was so thick that we were unable to see anything or whatever was shaking the tree. The strangest part, as if that wasn't strange, of all then followed for without warning the deep ape-like sound smoothly changed into what almost sounded like language. I remember that, that it was monotone, didn't sound random, and had an odd syntax of sorts, almost like someone mumbling. Dave, my best description would be if you were to play a record much slower than the speed at which it was recorded. In that case, you know what it sounds. In that case, you know that it's words you're hearing, but you can't decipher them. As a kid, I've done this many times with my record player just for fun. And that's exactly what the sounds reminded me of. After a few seconds of this, it all felt, fell silent and we never heard another sound from the bank. We didn't even hear anything leave the area. I don't believe that that entire event lasted much more than 10 to 12 seconds. To be honest, I saw nothing other than the shaking sapling. But Dave, whatever it was up there on that bank was big and it had big lungs. Our prayers to you and your family. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty good. I've heard similar things also in that area that he was in. So, good story. Next one. This one, this email kind of got me thinking. Maybe it'll get you thinking. Have you considered that in all of the encounters of experience, the only common denominator is you? Your, dev, your dad never had a weird experience, experience except when you were with him as a boy and that lighted fire happened. The barber never had a weird experience in 50 years except when you were with him and it went silent. Okay, the barber. He did tell me one story that he had. He said he was traveling down Highway 17 in Los Gatos, heading towards San Jose. And he said, Dave, there were cars all around me. And he said, out in the distance, I saw like a light coming at us and he said, Dave, I'm going 60 miles an hour north. It's going very fast south, right towards us, coming down from the sky towards me. And he said, it, it went by me so fast, I could hardly even tell what it was, except to say, it wasn't a helicopter, it wasn't a plane, and it might have been round, and it might have been shiny. He said, there were cars all around me. He goes, I'm in the middle of Los Gatos, San Jose. I said, what did you think it was, Frank? He goes, I don't know. 
So something did happen to him that was odd, but I'll go on with the story. The college student group had never had anything except those lights when you were with them. That's true. You are the common denominator. Are you possibly in attracting somehow? Things that make you ponder and reflect and reevaluate all the same things in your life up to this point. I wonder if you're, I wonder if you getting into this mystery field was just a random process that happened. Or did those Silicon Valley tycoons select you specifically for a reason? God, Yahweh, Jesus said that he had a plan for us before he created the foundations on the earth. So was your plan set in motion the day you were born to do exactly this? Bring the secret hidden things out of the darkness and into the purifying light. Just a thought that makes you go, hmm, I'd agree. Now I've had people from many different walks of religion that all seem to have a similar theme. And that is, is that you have this roadmap in life and really whatever you're going to do to detract from it, you're going to end up on it. Now, I can tell you that to get to this point where I am today was so astronomically out of the picture 20 years ago that it's hard to understand that I am here. And to think that I'm sitting here with you, even talking on a video, was so far out of the realm five years ago that I can't even believe it. Again, if it, wouldn't, if it wasn't for Ben and his interest in video and then his interest in my work, this never would have happened. So Ben and I sat around and kind of came up with this plan together after he showed an ability in film. But other than that, I wouldn't have been here. So yeah, a lot of weird things. It's like the juncture of a hundred different lanes coming together to end up at this location. But anybody over 20 years old, if I sat down with them and I said, how did you end up in this place in life? Especially older people. I talk about crossing that intersection. Later today, if I get into my car and I cross an intersection in four hours and 21 minutes, well, if I cross that intersection at four hours and 25 minutes and somebody ran that stop sign, was there a reason I wasn't there at that exact time? Did something hold me up? I don't know. But why I'm here and why I'm doing this, I don't know. I'm interested in saving lives. I'm interested in educating. I'm interested in helping. And I see that there's a huge gap in search and rescue that needs to be resolved. And I think that some search and rescue people, some, not the majority, some, need to pull their head out and realize there's something else going on. And I hear from you all the time. That's why I'm saying the majority know. <laughs> but they'll never say it in front of the majority. But they'll say it to me. So I appreciate it. And you know, you have my confidence. So, got some interesting stories for you today. As if those weren't interesting enough. So, first story has to do with a man who's an outdoorsman, a true outdoorsman. And he lived in Alaska, lived in Fairbanks. If you've never been there, it's worth going to because that surrounding country outside of Fairbanks is just awesomely beautiful. You can drive a mile outside of town and see all kinds of wildlife that you won't see in a zoo sometimes. Incident happened September 25th, 1965. He was 51 years old. Robert, his nickname was Rufus, last name was Coleman. He had three kids. His oldest was in high school. 
He was a civilian employee at Ellison Air Force Base, just outside of Fairbanks. And uh, he'd lived there in Fairbanks for 19 years. He knew the area very well. He liked to hunt and fish. And on that day, he told his family that he was going to go north on the Steese, S-T-E-E-S-E, S -T -E -E -S -E, Steese Highway, and go caribou hunting. Took off, said he'd be back by just a little after dark, came home, and he didn't, didn't make it. His wife got nervous, called the state troopers, and they went out, and they found his vehicle parked on the Steese Highway at mile number 76, 76 miles north of Fairbanks. State troopers got together and they immediately started searching. Let me give you a look-see. So, big river runs into Fairbanks here. There's another big river right here. This is the Steese Highway. It's mile number 76. This is uh, Rufus Coleman, 51 years old. So state troopers come out and they put a couple of airplanes into the air. A friend hears that his buddy's missing and they put a private helicopter up. And this got huge press in Fairbanks. Well, his wife Beatrice was front and center, thank God, in looking for her husband. And she was vocal about needing more assistance. So she had citizens come out and the press, like I said, got lots of coverage. Well, during that coverage, somebody came forward and said the day that Rufus was hunting, they heard somebody calling out for help. But they didn't know anyone was missing and they couldn't tell where it was coming from other than it was from the right side of where the vehicle was parked. His wife said he was wearing a red plaid Mackinac coat. So you should be able to pick this out pretty clearly. So searchers went out, helicopters, planes, four day search. They don't find anything. They didn't even find any tracks. Well, it started to snow at the end of the fourth day and they pulled out. There were subsequent searches of that area. They found nothing. Now, why does this one intrigue me? Because if you've been a follower of our work, you know that there's been several cases where people have heard others calling for help and they're never found. Never found. So it's been 56 years. Rufus has never been found. How can that be? Parked his car, should have been found. There was no animal predation. Like I said, they didn't even find tracks. So where'd he go? He was considered a, an extremely solid individual with a great work history and somebody who took care of his family. Bank accounts were never touched. Very, very strange case. Robert Rufus Coleman, 51 years old. So, next case, Upper New York. Now, that Upper New York region is always intrigued me. Yeah, because there's been a lot of people that have disappeared there. The Adirondack area, I've written about many. You talk about people missing from the lake area. A lot of people missing that were never found. And when you, when you go there and you look at the mountains, you know, they're okay, four or 5,000 feet, but they're nothing like what I'm used to, like 12, 14,000 foot mountains, huge cliffs. But there's a variety of missing cases there that make no sense. 
June 24th, 2000, uh, about 21 years ago, Harriet Olson, 75 years old. She lived in the uh, northern New York Lakes region, and she lived in a small city named Vermontville, just south of Vermontville. Very rural, very lush, tons of water everywhere. She lived off a street called Fletcher Farm Road. When I say there's water everywhere here, I really mean it. I mean everywhere around this area. This is Vermontville, Fletcher Farm Road, big lake right near it. It's a city called Bloomingdale, Harrietstown, Gabriel's Rainbow Lake. This is a Mackenzie Mountain wilderness area. So in this area, you can't go into it on a car. You can only ride into it on a horse or hike into it. So very, very rural area. So she's, that was her house. So picture Harriet. So she lived with her husband in this very rural home. It's about eight miles north of Lake Placid and about 25 miles southwest of Plattsburgh. June 24th, 2000, about 5 to 6 p.m., Harriet's inside the house making dinner, just like any other night. Husband's working in the garage. Sounds like every other American family. <laughs> Many of them. Anyhow, husband got done with his chores in the garage. He came in. She's gone. Their little dog is still in the house. And the husband said every time Harriet went out to take a walk, the dog always went with her. The dog was in the house. He called, looked around for an hour, and called the sheriff. They had lived in this area for 16 years. So the husband said there's no way she got lost. Henry heard nothing while he was in the garage that was suspicious. She didn't walk out the front door. He, she didn't come through the garage. Nothing. So the New York State Police respond with three canine teams and a helicopter and multiple ground pounders, people on foot. They didn't find any tracks leaving the residence. There was no scent trail. And this is something that really, really gets my goat. I found multiple articles that said that Harriet had showed signs of early dementia, but she hadn't been diagnosed with anything. Ha! Well, what is that? It's trying to give an answer to a complex story so you could just slough it off and not think anything weird happened. Oh, it was just another Alzheimer patient that walked away. No, that's not what happened. So, her, anyhow, her husband heard nothing. Massive search goes on. It's been 21 years. 21 years. <clears throat> and Harry Dolson's never been found. How could that be? How could the dogs not pick up a scent leaving that house? Well, I want, to, I want to explain something. This area in here, like I said, you could only walk into that or go in on horseback. This is less than a couple miles from their house. And this area has a lot of wildlife. This is a ski resort. But I also want you to know that in this area, there's a lot of residences. You know, four or five acre parcels, 10 acre parcels. But this general area of northern New York up to the Canadian mountains is filled with high strangeness. People have disappeared walking on the side of the road. They've disappeared in the mountains. There's a, a story where an individual was climbing a mountain with friends. He says, I'm just going to walk around the corner for a second. He walks around the corner and he disappears. So, don't know. The other thing, this thing happened with Harriet. It was dead quiet. The husband hadn't heard anything. So he left her in the house, fixing dinner, point of separation. 
Canines can't pick up any tracks. Water's everywhere. It's a cluster zone of missing people. So, what happened to Harriet Olson? It's easy for us to just push this away and forget it. But I can tell you that there are hundreds of cases of older people that have disappeared in North America and have never been found. Which from a search and rescue perspective makes no sense. Canines should be able to pick up on scent trails and people should have been found. Especially the lack of tracks is absolutely puzzling. Case always has bothered me ever since I wrote about it. Now, if you're a regular follower of this channel, then just a couple weeks ago, you remember I told you a story from an area called Ten Sleep, T-E-N Sleep, Wyoming, and the disappearance of a four-year-old boy named Ronnie Ray from a rural ranch. Remember that story? Well, same town, a hunter named Dale Hauger, H-A-U-G-E-R, 75 years old. October 22nd, 1970. Dale was staying with some friends in tent sleep. Well, he was originally from a city called Grable, and he was a railroad fireman, retired. What does that mean? I had to look it up. So a railroad fireman worked on a steam locomotive and his job was to make sure that the broiler was at the right temperature, that the flames inside were burning adequately, and he kept those fires burning. So Dale did that for a lifetime, retired, loved Wyoming, loved the outdoors, had no medical issues and was in good, decent shape. So he and his friend from Tent Sleep decided to go hunting in the area exactly where Ronnie Ray disappeared. So Ronnie Ray disappeared in 76, this case, October 1970. So Dale was described as healthy, but not, not greatly mobile. He and his hunting partner, who he was staying with, got separated, which isn't unusual when you're hunting. But his partner called out for him and couldn't find him. So they call the sheriff and they start a multi-day search. And they bring in everything you can imagine for the search. And they weren't finding anything. So after a five-day search, with it being very cold, the Washakie County Sheriff through three planes at this, equestrians, ground pounders, didn't find anything. And it was struggling. So they wait until the following spring when the snow melts because they had to pull searchers out because it was so cold and snowing. Wait till the following spring and do the same thing. Find, don't find anything. And the sheriff says, well, Hunters in the area, and there'll be many, will find them. Well, it has been 51 years, and Dale Hauger's never been found. How can that be? So in this one, it's, a, it's what we call a mini cluster. Two people in almost the exact area disappear just years apart. And within 10 miles of each other, Dale's German, weather, point of separation, and a subgroup of missing hunters. Pretty peculiar, to say the least. Now, every once in a while, this week, I got some interesting emails about, well, Dave, it's pretty obvious that there's somebody out there uh, that's killing these people in the woods. It's probably some, some trailside killer. Well. I wrote a big book. I came out with it in a second edition, as a matter of fact, called Missing 411 Hunters. And all it is is stories about hunters 
that disappeared on the trip. Now, about 60% of those people were never found, and then 40% were found under very peculiar circumstances. None of them were shot. None of them were stabbed. Lots of times, we didn't know how they died. So the theory that somebody's on the trail killing people really doesn't make a lot of sense. Because the number of times that there's been a killing on a trail is very rare, considering the number of trail hours that people spend. Now, I know people are going to send me stories about all the trail side killers. Yeah, I know that. I know about them. I'm from California. But it's very rare. And if you understood the 411 phenomena, you'd also understand that these people sometimes don't even show any tracks from where they disappear. The other thing is, let's say the average hunter weighs 150 to 200 pounds, some way much more, but let's just say. The effort it would take to dispose of a body would be huge. I'm 200 pounds. If I tried to pick up and carry somebody else who was 200 pounds, and I'm in pretty good shape, I couldn't carry him very far. I couldn't carry him very far at all. I might be able to drag him some distance. I might be able to push him downhill. But then you got to dig the hole. And you got to bury him. Folks, this isn't easy. To dispose of a body so that canines can't find it is very difficult. Even if you put the body in water, like let's say a lake, the body, as it deteriorates, gives out bubbles. Those bubbles are microscopic. They come to the surface. And the canines are trained to detect that. So just because you weight a body down and put it in a body of water thinking it's not going to be found, it's going to be found eventually if you put some, uh, some canines in there, some cadaver-trained canines. Even if you bury them underground, they can be detected at times. So to think that it's a trail side killer only shows that you really don't understand the paradigm. And I get it. And I try not to be impatient about it. I'm trying just to educate people slowly. But hang in there because it's a long education. Even if you read four or five books, you might not pick up on everything that we know to this point if you've been watching this channel. So. Dale Hager, 75 years old, missing on October 22nd, 1970. Harriet Olson, missing June 24th, 2000. She was also 75 years old. And Robert Rufus Coleman, 51 years old, Fairbanks, Alaska, missing September 25th, 1965. So what you do is you have two hunters, two hunters, and one housewife missing from the middle of her home. That is a rare occurrence in what I write about. Very rare. Now the sheriff spent a lot of time interviewing her husband and completely ruled him out as a suspect if that's what your thought pattern was. But understanding that Northern Lakes region of New York, when I read the story, it kind of fit in with everything else I know about it. So I'm glad the sheriff vetted the husband, but wouldn't have been a concern of mine. So those are the stories for this week. As I've stated before, I think missing hunters are a subgroup of intrigue to me because they're armed, because they're comfortable in the outdoors. They're not an easy target to say. Because hunters are trained observers most times, because they're out there, they're using all their senses to find game they are going to most likely be the ones that are going to find something that's unusual that I found. But again, I, uh, I'll say this again, and I'll say it probably many more times during the year. I'm interested in unusual stories from the woods. If you want me to withhold your name, I'm glad to. I, I usually don't tell a person's name, but uh, please send them forth. I appreciate it. Uh, it helps with our understanding of what is out there. And I'm very grateful to you, 
very grateful that you're here and participating. If you look at the first comment below the video where it says the definition, if you're on a TV, you might not see it, but if you're on a computer, laptop, you'll see this. First uh, line underneath there is a pinned comment, usually from me, that gives all the contacts where you can watch our documentaries, two of them, Missing 411, Missing 411, The Hunted. If you go to Amazon, you can watch uh, Vanished, which I made for the History Channel. And uh, go to Amazon and put in there on the bar, Missing 411, Western U.S., Missing 411, Eastern U.S., and then look at the price that they're charging for those books. And if you come to my site, which is listed on that pinned comment, you can find our books for just $24.99. Do not buy from Amazon, eBay. They're just going to rip you off. And uh, we're heading into the middle of winter, folks, so uh, stay warm. If you're in a car and you live in a very cold area, have a go box in the car. In that go box, gloves, hat, coat, blanket. And always, 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 if you're going to take a long drive somewhere, tell someone where you're going, when you're going to be there, and have somebody check on you occasionally. I know that there's a lot of young people and a lot of old people that tend to think, oh, I don't need somebody checking on me. Not true. As the stories here, even young people coming back from college have disappeared. Yes, true. So tell your folks or tell somebody the route you're going to take. Don't be trying to be big and bold and say, I don't need that. Yeah, there's missing people I've written about that have. And if you're going into the woods alone, carry a personal locator beacon. You can read up about those online and you can search for them on Amazon. They all work. They are all effective. So I don't recommend any. But uh, you don't need one that needs a subscription service where you need to pay every month. All you need is one that you activated and it sends search and rescue. Yeah, they're good devices. Everyone who goes in the woods alone should have one. So thank you for being here. I great, greatly appreciate each of you. And if YouTube's willing, I'll be here again in the weeks ahead. Polite us out.